This is Bloomberg Law with June Grosso from Bloomberg Radio. First of all, my first question is who bribed Hunter Biden to be here today? That's my first question. Um, Second question, you are the epitome of white privilege coming into the oversight committee, spitting in our face, ignoring a congressional subpoena to be deposed. What are you afraid of? You have no balls to come up here. and, Mr. Chairman, point of inquiry. Mr. Chairman. Um, if the, the lady if, recognized, if, if, the general, if the general lady Price wants to hear from Hunter Biden, we can hear from him right now, Mr. Chairman. Let's take a vote Price and hear from I'm Hunter speaking. Biden. What are, are you afraid of? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Order, Why order, order. House Republicans were having a hearing on holding Hunter Biden in contempt of Congress for defying a congressional subpoena to sit for a closed-door deposition. When, surprise, surprise, the president's son arrived at the Oversight Committee hearing and sat in the audience with his legal team, sending the panel into chaos. Biden has refused to sit for a closed-door deposition, but his attorney, Abby Lowell, said his client isn't afraid of speaking. He just wants to answer lawmakers' questions in a public format, where his words won't be taken out of context. Hunter chose a hearing where Republicans could not distort, manipulate, or misuse that testimony. Joining me is someone who saw the frenzy firsthand, Bloomberg News congressional reporter Billy House. Billy, give us the background for what happened today. So two House committees are going to recommend that the entire, the full House take a vote probably next week on whether to hold Hunter Biden in contempt of Congress. So those hearings to hold that committee-level vote were occurring today. And suddenly Hunter Biden showed up. And and this was kind of ironic because the the whole issue was or is that Hunter Biden has declined to testify privately. He has said he would testify publicly. But leaders of the Oversight and Judiciary Committee say he is not allowed to dictate the terms of a subpoenaed testimony request. So that's where we are. He showed up and his people said he's ready to testify in public. But the committee said, no, we want you to testify first privately. And so that was this odd situation where the committees are moving ahead with contempt recommendations for him deciding not to testify privately. I don't know if this committee is worse than other House committees, but it seemed like it was totally out of control. Oh, the members on this committee are some of those uh, names that many people can recognize right off the bat, including Marjorie Taylor, uh, MTG Green, and others who often quip and say what they have at the top of their mind. And that's what happened this morning many of them hurling insults at the Hunter Biden camp for him being there and and asking, you know, weird questions about why he's there, but he won't testify privately. Yeah, it was quite a scene. It's kind of odd to have a contempt citation for someone who says he'll testify. Well, that's precisely the weirdness of this, and it's not that it wasn't weird enough. Here's the issue. Hunter Biden showing up today may have actually, in some ways, helped the Republican arguments that he should first appear for private questioning. Their whole argument is that he and his lawyer, Abby Lowell, want to show up and, and testify publicly because they want to make a spectacle out of it now. now, And then that there are answers they need first in initial private questionings without a circus. Now, the other claim could be, well, he's here now, he's ready, ask him those questions. So that's the kind of the uh, the tension that's evolving here. But essentially, members of Congress say they're allowed to set the terms of their subpoena, and their subpoena says, hey, you first initially show up for private questioning. And Representative Jared Moskowitz, a Democrat from Florida, went through a list of, and he had the paperwork, of subpoenas that House Republicans haven't complied with. Well, that's absolutely true. Uh, you might remember when Democrats were in charge of the chamber uh, last session. There was a flurry of uh, Trump and January 6th related contempt movements against Mark Meadows, Trump's former chief of staff, Steve Bannon. Uh, None of them complied. A lot of them were referred, as this could be, to the Justice Department for prosecution. And uh, he is absolutely correct. Contempt has become the new, uh, another way, like impeachment, of punishments that used to be rare but now seem to be almost modus operandi. Another thing is that Hunter Biden is being investigated and is facing federal prosecutions, so it even seems unusual for his attorney to allow him to testify in any format. Well, that's a very good point, too. He faces at least two criminal indictments on his own. This really doesn't touch on those issues, though. What's at issue here with this 
subpoena request is for Hunter Biden to talk about his family's business dealings and the House re- impeachment effort to try to see if there was any linkage uh, to the president himself in benefiting his family through his position at the White House. And have House Republicans found any evidence linking Joe Biden so far? To date, absolutely none. And, and mind you, this has been an investigation that's been formal since uh, impeachment investigation since December. But actually, uh, the Oversight Committee in the House especially has been conducting investigation into this for over a year. Have you ever seen the subject of a hearing, a committee hearing on contempt actually show up? You know, I haven't. And that's what was interesting. Uh, as brash of personalities, as I've mentioned, Steve Bannon, Mark Meadows, Peter Navarro, some of the Trump aides, uh, even former Attorney General William Barr, none of those guys and gals ever showed up for this sort of thing. So Hunter Biden did, whether that kind of amplifies what Republicans claim he is more into creating a circus or whether he's legitimately saying, hey, I'm here, I'm ready to answer questions, let's get it done. You know, that's up for debate on the both sides of the aisle. And I have to say the language of some of the Republican committee members, the way they talked about Hunter Biden was just very low and crass. I mean, they really had no respect for him at all. Oh, absolutely. I I won't say it was an all-time low, but it was incredibly jarring to hear some of that language. And I think it reflects some of the membership in the modern House Republican conference, but it also reflects some of the frustration they've had at being unable to really find anything linking the president to Hunter Biden and his his other family members' finances. This was a, a stunt by Hunter Biden and his attorney. But I'm wondering what your take is on how this is for Biden himself to to have even more attention on his son for this stunt. That also is a very good question. I don't know, but polls seem to suggest this certainly isn't helping President Biden. How much harm it's doing uh, as opposed to the president's problems on the border and maybe government funding and maybe it's hard to tell. But this episode and this droning on about Hunter Biden and family finances is certainly not helping the president. And what stage is the impeachment inquiry at? Well, it's still said to be uh, in its initial stage, but uh, Judiciary Committee Chairman Jim Jordan has suggested that as early as February, actual hearings on impeachment could begin. Now, that's going to take a call from Speaker Mike Johnson later to proceed to that point and electable uh, damage that could do to so-called swing district Republicans in areas that Biden actually won in in the last election. They voted to hold the impeachment inquiry, but none of them necessarily want an actual impeachment proceeding to occur. That, That remains to be played out. Jim Jordan, head of the Judiciary Committee, another person who ignored a subpoena. Do you think they have the votes in the full House to hold Hunter Biden in contempt? It comes down, I believe, to those 17 or so, as I mentioned, swing district Republicans. Remember, Mike Johnson right now, the speaker, can only lose two Republican votes on anything, impeachment or anything. If he loses more than that because of the razor thin edge he has in the majority, that measure does not pass. So only three Republicans have to get wobbly need on impeachment for for it not to be able to move forward. Finally, I've been reading that the tenure of Johnson is tenuous at this point. Is he having problems already? It's really remarkable. Uh, there were a series of meetings this week, including this morning, uh, private meetings, where he was being hit by very angry Republican colleagues about not doing enough to cut spending or, or try to cut spending or do on the border. He's already getting hammered, and some far-right Republicans, like Chip Roy of Texas, are already floating the old motion to vacate the the method that they got rid of uh, former Speaker Kevin McCarthy for cooperating with Democrats for. So it's already sounding bad. Whether they actually go ahead with something against uh, Johnson is is unclear. It's an exciting time to cover the House, Billy. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's Billy House, Bloomberg News congressional reporter. Coming up next on the Bloomberg Law Show, we'll look at the groups behind the efforts to remove Trump from the ballot and especially behind the Colorado case that the Supreme Court will be considering. Billionaire Russian oligarch Dmitry Rybolovlev owns a Greek island, a Monaco soccer team, a super yacht, of course, 
and real estate around the world. He also owns a world-class art collection with paintings by Picasso, Van Gogh, Gauguin, and Monet, among others. These days, he's spending his time in a New York courtroom where he's suing Sotheby's for more than two hundred thirty million dollars. Rybolovlev claims that Sotheby's helped a Swiss art dealer, Yves Bouvier, dupe him out of hundreds of millions of dollars because the dealer bought artworks through Sotheby's and then turned around and sold them to Rybolovlev at markups worth tens of millions of dollars. In its defense, Sotheby says it had no idea that Bouvier was lying to Rybolovlev about protracted negotiations with sellers to get the billionaire to overpay for four masterpieces. And what Bouvier did after he bought the art was not the auction house's business. Joining me is Bloomberg legal reporter Chris Domesh, who's covering the trial. Give us a sort of a look into these secretive art world deals. It's interesting. While this is the art world and it's kind of inherently um, secret just in the way it operates, maybe some of our um, listeners might see the parallels to, say, bond trading and things like that, where there's no, there's no exchange or central exchange that you can look up the prices of a Picasso or a Da Vinci. You know, it, it undergoes a valuation process by auction houses like Sotheby's and by private actors. And, you know, often some of the participants don't really want to have their identities out there at any point in the process. They just want to sell the work. So therefore, it can kind of lead to this kind of opaque market where you don't really know what the true value of a work is until, you know, somebody buys it. I mean, that's really the true value of it is somebody's willing to pay a certain amount of money for the work. And that has led, you know, through the years, I mean, there's certainly other cases where collectors have felt that they were misled by dealers as to, you know, how much they paid for something like that. But this case is really at the high end of the art market. And I mean, we're talking about a Da Vinci that was the most expensive artwork ever sold. And needless to say, you don't often see Russian billionaires on the stand <laughs> in, in federal court in New York. So that alone makes it a fascinating case. And to kind of have just the art world laid bare for an audience in federal court is, is really, really interesting. So tell us what Rybolovlev's claim is. So he claims, and he's claimed all along, that this was, this was a... Um, that this was a massive fraud hoisted on him by Yves Bouvier, who was his art dealer for many, many years, and who was arrested in 2015 as he was going to the billionaire's apartment in Monaco thinking he was completing a deal for a Mark Rothko painting. And instead he was arrested, and it's been almost a decade of various legal maneuvers. The dealer and Rybolovlev have settled. Um, they settled late last year, so that he's no longer involved in the case. But essentially, he alleges that the auction house uh, helped the dealer kind of mislead him into these deals by providing documents that supported the valuations that he claims were excessive and allowed the dealer to pocket, you know, more than a billion dollars in improper payments that he wasn't aware was being paid. Essentially, he says, you know, that he would just buy these things in private pretend he was negotiating with the sellers and then just sell it to him while making up a whole line of talks about acquiring the painting. It seems like it's odd for the jury to see him suing Sotheby's when the man who's at the heart of this is not in the courtroom. For sure. And that's what Sotheby's is hanging its hat on here, is that they say, you know, this is (laughs) <laughs> a billionaire. This is a guy who does regularly large transactions, buys a lot of art, owns the Monaco soccer team, and should have been, you know, familiar, should have done his own due diligence rather than relying on the statements of an art dealer who one could easily suspect might have a, a different interest, especially when he doesn't know all the parties involved in the negotiation. In the opening statements, did they discuss the settlement that he made with Bouvier? Yeah, I mean, it's it, the settlement itself, not really. It's just kind of, you know, they allude to the fact that he's not going to be there and that even though his name is really the center of the case, that he is not a defendant um, and he's not involved. And Bouvier's lawyers point to the fact that Rybolovlev did not win the legal actions he brought against Bouvier in jurisdictions around the world, Monaco, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Geneva. And also, federal prosecutors were looking into Bouvier and dropped the case. 
Yes, at some point, the prosecutors here in the Southern District of New York had spent more than a year building a case against the dealer. But then after Rybolovlev sold the Da Vinci work for the record amount, $450 million, more than triple what he paid, I, we reported that, indeed, that if they had dropped the probe saying that there was no real way that they could prove criminality. And that is also my question here. Rybolovlev is seeking more than $232.5 million in damages. He sold that to Vinci for $450 million, more than triple what he paid. Is he deducting that? There's a certain amount of deduction going on, yes, but not really. I mean, he's going for specifically the overcharges. The amounts that they paid that, that essentially the Bouvier tacked on to the end to make a false profit. So they're not really looking to recoup any money that they paid or that they didn't make. But, yeah, I mean, that's a, that is the elephant in the room, correct, is the fact that the dealer is not there. So um, it will probably be difficult for the jury to determine really whether he was misled. It's probably likely there's going to be a split verdict. You're already yeah. anticipating a split verdict. Um, well, it just seems ripe for it. I mean, you can never really predict what's going to happen in a criminal case, but given you're, you're dealing with five different transactions involving four artworks, it's possible that they may see mis- they misled him in certain ones and not in the others, but it's also possible they may not see that at all. Another elephant in, in the room is that this is a Russian billionaire suing over hundreds of millions of dollars in art deals. He's not a very sympathetic plaintiff. It's hard to say. You never know what a jury's going to, the way a jury's going to look um, at a person like this. But it's like I said, it's not every day you have a Russian billionaire on the stand, and just to have him testifying is, is amazingly interesting. It's just fascinating to watch him be on the stand. We just don't have that kind of level of insight into the art world in general, much less <laughs> Russian oligarchs. Yeah, has he been on the stand already? No, he will take the stand probably next week. They've kind of been hedging. They say he's got some sort of medical problem or physical problem that doesn't allow him to sit more than three hours at a time. So he will be on the stand. They said he will definitely take the stand yesterday. So So what do they have to prove against Sotheby's? That they knew what was going on? Yes, essentially, that they knew that there was a fraud, that they knew that Mr. Bouvier was was defrauding the billionaire and that there's no way he could have known that and that they helped him. Even if Sotheby's knew that he was selling the work for more money than he paid for it, is Sotheby's required to tell to tell Rebolovlev about that? Well, I don't know if it's so much that as they helped him create documents that supported the valuations okay. that they say were overcharging him. And that he relied on those documents. You know, the Sotheby's is arguing they didn't have any knowledge of his fraud or breach of fiduciary duty or about any of his lies about the prices he paid and that they didn't help him. Do you know what kind of evidence he has to show that Sotheby's knew? So, so far, they've been presenting a number of the um, deal documents for each of the works. Some of them are contracts. Some of them are simply invoices that they would pay. At some point, they decided that it was more efficient to handle these purchases through straight invoice paying rather than having a contract that delineated the duties of Bouvier. You know, that may have come out in the settlement. You know, that that may have been one of the reasons they settled is that he had no contractual duty to the billionaire to tell him everything here, um, that he was acting at arm's length and not necessarily as his agent. But if they can prove that Bouvier was acting directly as an agent, of Rybolovlev and was lying to him at the same time, they could possibly find Sotheby's liable. The judge, in an order last March, urged the lawyers to work toward a settlement to avoid a trial that would be, quote, expensive, risky, and potentially embarrassing to both sides. I could see the embarrassment to Sotheby's. What would be the embarrassment to Rybolovlev? Well, there's always the potential for any court case to kind of reveal unseemly details of your life or of purchases you've made or things you've done. And that seems to be pretty limited here. It doesn't look like they're going to be going beyond the scope. But I think the judges often say, look, this is not going to be a great outcome for either party if we go to trial. And that's kind of that supports, you know, when I say that there may be a split verdict here, because often in civil cases, 
it's not a total win to one side or the other. Mm-hmm. It's it's a mixed bag. It can sometimes reveal secrets you don't want to be revealed, and sometimes you don't get the money you want. Um, in this case, this is kind of the billionaire's last shot at getting anything from this entire episode that's lasted over more than a decade because he settled with Bouvier. Virtually all of the investigations that have gone on overseas have ended. So this is a really last shot. Would this be a great stain on Sotheby's if they're found liable? Well, it's, it's an auction house that relies on it, on its reputation for sure. It's hard to say whether you know the outcome of one trial would permanently tarnish that reputation. But it's certainly not something that I think that they would that they would like to have out there, especially as they continue to court potential customers and other um, clients. How long is the trial expected to last? It's probably going to last at least a month. This is a, a rare case where we have greatly varying estimates of how long they think it will need. The, the defendants think it could take as much as seven weeks, but that would be hard to see. Wow, that seems like a long time. No wonder the judge wanted them to settle it. Thanks so much, Chris. That's Chris Domesh, Bloomberg Legal Reporter. Donald Trump's removal from primary ballots in Colorado and Maine was a win for two activist groups funded largely by liberal donors that have worked methodically to transform a scholarly thought experiment about the 14th Amendment into a real-world legal strategy. Joining me is Bloomberg News legal reporter Emily Birnbaum, who's written about the groups. Give us a little bit of the history of this 14th Amendment effort, which started with legal scholars. Yeah, so the question of whether Trump could be deemed an insurrectionist under the 14th Amendment has been ongoing essentially since the events of January 6th. So legal experts have pointed to Section 3 of the 14th Amendment um, and said, you know, this could potentially result in Trump being banned from the ballot, as well as other lawmakers who were involved in the January 6th Capitol Hill riot. So legal scholars have been debating it, as well as activists. So that includes the liberal group Free Speech for People. As early as 2021, they had initiated a campaign to get people to submit letters to their secretaries of state asking for Trump not to be allowed on the ballot in 2024. And when did Crew or Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington get involved? They're a more recent entry into the debate, um, but they're a very powerful force in Washington. They're really well known. They have a lot of money compared to a lot of other advocacy groups. So they got involved more starting last year. Um, they said, Trump, if you are going to run for president again, then we're going to oppose you under the 14th Amendment. And so they got involved, particularly in the Colorado case, which is the case that made it to the Supreme Court and probably the most important case in the country right now. How do they raise money? So Crew has been around for decades now, and the main source of their funding is some well-known liberal philanthropists. So that includes George Soros. His nonprofits have been giving to crew for, you know, over a decade now. They have gotten money from a lot of different liberal foundations, and they started off as a staunchly nonpartisan organization, um, you know, fighting corruption in government. And around the 90s, they became associated more with the left. And what about Free Speech for People? Free Speech for People is a group that was actually founded out of the 2010 Citizens United decision by the Supreme Court. So they were a group founded to fight the issue of money in politics. They also have some pretty well-known liberal funders. So the most recent grants that they've gotten, most significant grants that they've gotten have been from Craig Newmark. So he's the founder of Craigslist. He's known for giving to a lot of you know, election integrity causes. So they have kind of changed from 2010 from a money and politics fighting organization to more broadly a fighting corruption and government organization. Are the two groups working together or in tandem in any way on this 14th Amendment issue? The two of them are definitely aware of one another. They definitely um, talk about strategy, you know, we're going to file here, where are you going to file? But they're taking pretty different tasks when it comes to what they think will be the most successful legal strategy. So CREW has decided to go all in on Colorado. Colorado has 
state level rules that make it easier to oppose someone being on the ballot. Um, they decided to spend a lot of time choosing particular plaintiffs in the state, whereas Free Speech for People has decided to take a broader strategy and launch legal challenges in multiple states. So that includes Minnesota, Michigan, Illinois, Massachusetts. And so they're going both through the courts and also making direct outreach to secretaries of state. Tell us a little bit more about how Crew orchestrated the Colorado challenge, you know, how they decided on the plaintiffs and the lawyers. Yeah, so they identified Colorado as their best shot at getting something across the finish line, essentially, due to some of these state level rules. And so they reached out to the best known elections lawyer in the state, both on the Republican side and on the Democratic side. And those lawyers then reached out to people they've known, particularly Republicans and unaffiliated voters. They felt like that would give them the strongest legal arguments. And even some people who had voted for Trump the last time around who are saying this time he shouldn't be on the ballot due to his actions around January 6, 2021. So Crew was highly involved in getting the lawyers involved in helping to do the press around, you know, their actions and helping to shape the legal arguments. We all know that the Supreme Court has taken up the Colorado case now. What part is Crew going to have in that? It's Crew's case, so they're going to be the ones handling the arguments. So a Crew lawyer is going to be handling the legal arguments on February 8th, which is when oral arguments are scheduled for, and they're already hard at work filing briefs and making the best case to the Supreme Court. Did they mention anything about the time pressure? Because this is, you know, really quick for a Supreme Court case, about a a month Yeah, a lot of people I've spoken to have been very aware of, you know, the impending election. And like, this is a very time sensitive issue. They've pointed out, you know, Supreme Court moved really fast when it came to Bush v. Gore. They moved really fast when it came to the Pentagon Papers. And they're definitely hoping they'll move really fast on this case, too, because it is so pressing. So I think that people were heartened that SCOTUS took up the case pretty quickly and scheduled arguments for only a few weeks from now. There are a lot of people who are going to be filing amicus briefs and who probably want to impact what crew does, what its lawyers say in their briefs and through oral arguments. Do you know if crew is open to advice from some of the legal scholars and experts? Definitely. They're definitely coordinating really closely with a lot of the scholars, both liberal and conservative, who have made arguments about the 14th Amendment. So I get the sense that they're working really hard to make sure they have good, solid legal arguments and amicus briefs that are going to be filed. Does free speech for people have any part in the Supreme Court case? So they're just continuing to file challenges at the state level, but they do plan to file a brief and to support the Colorado case as much as they can. Of course, any precedent that comes out of the Supreme Court is going to shape the state level efforts and, you know, could either bolster their claims or harm them. So I think right now it's mostly at the level of planning to file a brief. And what states are they pushing to get Trump off the ballot? So right now they filed challenges last week in Massachusetts and Illinois, um, and we're still waiting on um, a decision from Oregon. So those are the states where they've focused the most resources and attention as of right now. But I think we can continue to watch more and more challenges filed in the weeks ahead because they're facing deadlines for um, filing these kinds of challenges. And uh, they lost cases in Michigan and Minnesota already, but um, they will probably revive those efforts once we get to the general election, because both courts said that they could revisit the question, but not in the primaries. Thanks so much, Emily. That's Bloomberg legal reporter Emily Birnbaum. And that's it for this edition of the Bloomberg Law Podcast. Remember, you can always get the latest legal news by subscribing and listening to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and at Bloomberg.com slash podcast slash law. I'm June Grosso, and this is Bloomberg.